Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, and Donkey Kong 64 are three of my favorite games ever made, and if you've been watching me for a long time now, you probably know this already. Banjo and Kazooie are just my best friends in the world, I love these big, stupid idiots to death, and the DK crew is not far behind. I love the worlds and the characters, they're so full of personality and humor, it truly feels like the developers actually enjoyed making the games. They're relics of a different bygone era, where instead of hiring 600 programmers and then working them to death, forcing them to fuck up all the games just to fire them all a week later because of money, the development teams were relatively modest by today's standards and it seemed like everyone was involved. These games felt like a product of love and passion rather than an assembly line of steam, blood, sweat, and tears culminating into a bucket of $60 mush. There are also games that I've played to death because of how much I love them and it's for this reason that I think I have some reasonable foundation to start saying really horrible things about them now. This is Gabbage Land, which is this super smart new series I've started. It's kinda like my regular game reviews, except instead, this is for the express purpose of shitting all over whatever game it is I'm talking about. I've come to understand, after playing games for so long, that there are no perfect video games. Not even Banjo-Kazooie. Therefore, I've decided that I'm gonna comb over a lot of my favorite games again with a singular focus on everything that's bad about them. Trust me, this is a really smart and original idea, I think I'm the first YouTuber to ever do this. I've played these games way more than most people, I'm sure. I can't prove it, but I'm just pretty sure. For Banjo-Kazooie specifically, I even played an avalanche of ROM hacks, so I know how the game works. I've even studied the beta versions, you get it, I am supremely dedicated to this game and I know it very well. And when you've played the same games as much as I have, you start to notice problems. My first issue with Banjo-Kazooie is pacing. Banjo-Kazooie is famous for being a very immediate game that presents you with a lot of satisfying collectibles that boost endorphins and make your brain feel good. This is absolutely true, for the most part. You see, the game kinda grinds to a halt once you've gotten everything in a level except for like one or two notes, because now you have to slowly circumnavigate the entire map to look for these two collectibles that you probably just missed because the camera didn't let you see them, or the game didn't render them because they were too far away. Now just for clarity, this video is talking mainly about the original versions of each game, not the Xbox remakes. In the original version, you can't take notes off the level. Instead, to increase your total, you have to get the highest note score, which forces you to get all 100 notes on a level in one perfect run without leaving or dying. Now for a master like me, it isn't as much of a problem most of the time because of how well I know the game. For a newcomer, however, I can definitely see this being a bitch and a half, because it totally is. This issue is only made worse by the fact that the collectibles are not rendered at a certain distance, presumably to save on processing power. It's really cool that every level has a high vantage point that lets you get a lay of the land and whatnot, but if you're trying to find collectibles and the game just simply won't show them to you because they're too far away, it kinda defeats the purpose. I think this aspect of the game is the reason levels like Rusty Bucket Bay are so widely despised. This is a level that could just insta-kill you if you make a bad jump, forcing you to say goodbye to everything you just accomplished. I'm really not sure why the notes respawn. I always assumed it was to save on storage space because every single note would have to have some sort of binary switch assigned to it that would determine whether or not you collected it. And to save that state for each individual note would be too many things for the cartridge to save. But if that's the case, how does Danky Kang 64 remember the state of existence of 500 bananas, 25 golden bananas, and all the other shit for each level? I don't know. Look, I'm most definitely the worst programmer in history, but if Danky Kang, which was made by the same developer, could do it, why not Banjo? I don't know, but the fact that it's even possible in DK and Banjo-Tooie for that matter makes me wonder if it was just an oversight. The next thing I want to talk about is the transformations. For the unaware, the transformations work like this. You collect these things called Mumbo tokens, and you trade these tokens to Mumbo, and in return, he transforms you into stuff. Sounds cool, but here's where it gets stupid. In order to transform back into Banjo and Kazooie, you had to either leave the level and break the boundaries of the magic, or walk all the way back to Mumbo's hut to get him to change you back. It's so dumb, because most of the transformations are for extremely incidental stuff like Mr. Vile, who's a huge piece of shit, or getting access to the Termite Mountain and the process of turning back into Banjo and Kazooie inadvertently makes the game longer 
by filling it with useless bullshit. If I had to propose a solution, I'd suggest maybe using the mumbo tokens to unlock transformations and then being able to swap them with the D-pad or the L button or something, and maybe add restrictions so like you can only do that in certain places where it's necessary. The other thing is the transformations are all defenseless and often don't have any real special attributes besides the ability of getting into places that you can't under normal circumstances. Then there's dumb things like this where Boggy only has a small sled so you can only race him if you're a small walrus which doesn't even make sense because those fuckers are huge. It also doesn't help that there are a lot of collectibles that can only be found with the transformation. So let's say you have 90 something notes and in order to get the rest you need to do the transformation but if you don't have enough tokens and there aren't enough on the level, you're screwed. This is the dumbest possible combination of problems I can think of. And while we're talking collectibles, here's another dumb thing. Remember the empty honeycomb pieces? There's 24 of these in the game total, and you need 6 to upgrade your health bar. You'd think that'd mean you can upgrade it 4 times, but no. Once you get the last 6, it doesn't do shit. What's the point of that? But I think the one thing I hate the most about this game has to be Grunty's Furnace Fun. It's a big board game where you can only move to the next space if you correctly pass the trial of the one you're standing on. This is a really fun idea on paper, but here's where it gets stupid, okay? There are a lot of quiz sections, and while a lot of them are just details and observations you would make about the world, the music, the characters, and scenery, one category of questions is all personal questions about Gruntilda herself. The only way to find the answers to these questions is to find Grunty's sister, Brentilda, and ask her about Grunty. Brentilda tells you three facts about Grunty every time you meet her, which means you gotta bust out a notepad and a pencil. It's so lame, because instead of rewarding you for being observant and taking in your surroundings for the entire game, it's just like, yeah, did you know Grunty eats ice cream made from whale jizz? Isn't that nasty? Don't forget it, that's important, that's really fucking important. And there's like, 30 of these questions, so yeah, it's bad. This doesn't make me feel like I'm on a high adventure to take down some evil witch. It makes me feel like I'm studying for an online quiz for some elective college course that I don't give a fuck about. I don't care if Grunty scrubs her ass crack with a toothbrush, that's her prerogative and I'm gonna fuck her up either way. And the worst part is the answers are random. Every time you start a new game, the answers are completely different, which means you absolutely cannot skip this process or you'll just be flying blind at the end of the game. If I were to offer a solution to this, I would instead have other characters or environmental details strewn throughout the game that make casual references to Grunty's personal life. Like if Conga offhandedly mentions that Grunty's pet alligator dick tits ate his son or some shit, instead of just talking to Brentilda three times every time you meet her. Fast forward a year later, here comes Donkey Kong 64. This is often considered to be an honorary Banjo-Kazooie game. It's another 3D platformer collectathon. it's a big, big adventure with a fuck ton of things to collect. No really, this game is big. Really big. It's ridiculous how big this game is. I think it still holds the record for most collectibles in a game or a platformer or something like that. It has some record, I'm pretty sure. Now, I like that because I'm autistic and big numbers make me incredibly horny, but here's where it gets fucked up, okay? See, the bananas and the blueprints are all color-coded and only characters associated with the corresponding color can collect those items. It doesn't matter if you can access the red bananas as Donkey Kong, you can't collect them. It just doesn't let you. What is the point of that? Half the time it just inflates the runtime of the game because you gotta run over to the fucking barrel to swap to another character just to get these things. What is the point? It's just lame. It's not like it takes an extra amount of skill or intuition to do this either, it just takes more time. You wanna know what makes it even worse? Character specific collectibles only show up once you unlock that character, which means every time you reunite with one of your Kongrads, you now have to scour the level all over again for these new collectibles. Why couldn't they just have everything on the map from the beginning so you could plan it out in your head for when you do unlock those characters? Or better yet, don't put color-coded items in your video games. Not unlike the transformations in Banjo-Kazooie, it makes every single part of the game take longer because you inevitably come across a part of the level you can't do shit with unless you're the right character. Remember, every single level has 100 bananas and 5 golden bananas for each character, which makes for a total of 500 bananas and 25 golden bananas per level, which actually makes it even worse than the transformations in Banjo because now, you effectively have five different transformations to play as in each level, and you'll be swapping them out constantly. 
instantly. Again, it could be more convenient by letting you just change on the spot instead of having to keep running back and forth to the barrel. And yeah, put restrictions on that so in some places you have to be a certain character. I mean, that's the biggest reason they make you change anyway, so just cut out the middleman. Just hard coded so that you can only enter certain places as certain characters instead of having this dumbass barrel system that probably adds a cumulative 7 hours of filler to this already huge magnum dong runtime of this game. And it certainly doesn't help that the placement of a lot of these items is often not very intuitive either. Why are there purple coins down here? Chunky literally had to break the floor to get here, okay? This is Chunky Zone. Why would Tiny Kong ever go down here? How about these blue coins up here? Why would Lanky Kong ever come here? Or better yet, how? Oh, okay. But what the fuck? Could you imagine if this game had the problem Banjo does where you wouldn't be able to take notes off of the level? That would be fucked up if that actually happened, but don't worry, they replaced that with something even worse called minigames. Yeah, a good chunk of the golden bananas are hidden behind these dipshit minigames, half of which are repeated like three times each, which wouldn't be so bad except for this fucking beaver bitch minigame which makes me want to drive a truck through a shopping mall. There's also this dipshit ability you get near the end of the game where you can use the guns as snipers by zooming in. It's just a thinly veiled way of disguising the shitty render distance for 2D objects. Oh yeah, did I mention this game also has the same draw distance problem Banjo does? It's not quite as annoying because you can actually take shit off the level. That definitely makes things better. But then there's the banana tokens. These things are stupid. You wanna know why? Because most of them don't fucking matter. By the end of the game, you'll have like 98 of these fuckers per character, and they do nothing. There's a finite number of them, which would suggest, to a moron like me, that they're like this super important item that you have to collect all of, but you don't. Their main purpose is for buying new power-ups and upgrading your gun's health and musical instruments. But they don't require a massive amount of coins in the end, and as a result, you have all these coins lying around that ultimately do nothing. Like, what's the point? It'd be awesome if there was like a chameleon or something in K. Rool's office that gives you health upgrades or damage upgrades or something like that if you give him 50 coins or something ridiculous. Just some special little thing for going to the trouble to get all these coins you otherwise don't need. But let's talk about the game at a fundamental level again. In 3D platformers, the guy who set the standard for every game to come is Mario. And the great thing about Mario 64 was its movement, which allowed for several approaches to completing a mission. On paper, having five characters with unique movesets and attributes sounds awesome because it could, in theory, give you a similar sense of freedom in how you approach the game. Unfortunately, Donkey Kong 64 pretty much offers you only one way to get every single banana because every single character has five per level and only they are allowed to get their own golden bananas. This isn't an objectively bad thing, mind you, but considering how many moves the game gives you, this could have been the perfect opportunity for slightly more open gameplay. Instead, the moves are largely incidental and are only to be used in very specific circumstances. Here's an example. In Frantic Factory, Chunky presses a switch and a golden banana appears under this crusher in this cluster fuck of platforming. Right now you're thinking, okay, well Chunky is the biggest, fattest tub of shit in the entire Donkey Kong universe, which is completely true. This man is canonically 2,000 pounds. Clearly, he's not the ideal candidate for tricky jumps and that's where the ideas come in. You think, well, what if I press the switch as Chunky, but then switch to Diddy Kong and grab the banana? Bitch, you thought. Nope. Idiot. And it is for these reasons that I consider Banjo-Tooie to be the best game in the trilogy. Whether intentional or not, there are a lot of jiggies in this game that can be obtained in more ways than one, because the developers just give you an absolute shitload of maneuvers and they don't try to hard code it so that you couldn't do certain things in a certain way. You could pay actual money to get into the room at Jolly's Bar, or you could just destroy the door with grenades. And that's just the kind of stuff that's officially part of the game. The meta game is where shit goes down. You could get this jiggy with a glide move you get later, or you could use the momentum of the speedy shoes to make a really long jump over there, and then when they run out, you combo that into a double jump and a spin. All of this dumb shit you can do is awesome. Instead of hard coding it out and forcing you to do everything in one exact way, they allow you to exploit every tool at your disposal and they don't try to rip control away from you. Banjo-Tooie still has minigames, but instead of chasing beavers down a fucking hole, you're actually doing fun things like playing kickball and shooting balloons out of the air and running through rings and stuff. 
stuff. And better yet, the minigames actually make contextual sense as well. Instead of jumping into a barrel that transports you to the beaver dimension, you get eaten by a dinosaur so you can shoot all the bacteria growing in his stomach. Banjo-Tooie also has a functioning warp system with a menu and everything, instead of just warping between two pads with the same number on them. And you get the ability to zoom in and out when you look super early in the game, meaning the shitty draw distance is not as much of a problem anymore. There was a time Banjo-Tooie was indisputably my favorite video game ever created, and even since my tastes have diversified, it's still up there. So there it is, Banjo-Tooie, the perfect video game. But actually no. While it is true that there are a number of puzzles that can be solved in many ways, there still exist a good number of very incidental moves that in some cases only ever get used once or twice. That's cause you get them right near the end after you've done everything. Also, for some ungodly reason, this game has a shitload of unskippable cutscenes and interruptions in every single level whenever something substantial happens. Every time Mumbo does something, there's a long cutscene. Every time you freeze somebody or talk to them or solve a puzzle or whatever, cutscene. Every time you summon the train, cutscene. And what happens immediately after you see the train leave the station it's in? Cutscene. Did we really need all of that? Did we really need all of that unskippable garbage? Why do you do this to me? Let's talk about the Jinjos. In Banjo-Kazooie, there are five Jinjos on every level and getting them all gets you a Jiggy. In this game, the Jinjos are all segregated by skin color because the game takes place in 1962. They only give you a Jiggy once you collect a set. This wouldn't be so bad, except the placement of these Jinjos is completely random, so in theory, you could get some Jiggies early on if the smaller families happen to be clustered near the beginning of the game, or you won't be able to get them for a long time because they're clustered at the end. Now, I dislike RNG so much that I made an 8 minute video on it, so naturally I have beef with this, just at a fundamental level. Then there's the worst sin of all, Pterodactyl Land. This is where every single flaw Banjo-Tooie has decides to go fucko mode. A lot of people say this game is confusing, but I don't really find it that way because every level is detailed and the individual parts of the levels are distinct from one another due to great landmarks, except for Pterodactyl Land. Every single part of this level looks exactly the same, and even after playing this game for almost 20 years, I still get completely lost here. And all of this is made worse by the fact that there are two transformations, the big dinosaur and the small dinosaur. If you want to be the small dinosaur, you just talk to Wumbo like normal. If you want to be the big one, you have to go to Mumbo, switch to him, walk all the way back to Wumba, watch a cutscene of transforming the hut into a bigger one, walk all the way back, switch to Banjo, walk all the way back, talk to her again. And this is a big level, so if you miss something and have to transform back into something more than once, you have to do all that crap all over again. This is evil. Whoever made this level is evil. I think my favorite part of Banjo-Tooie is when you talk to someone as a different character and they literally say some shit like, I'm sorry, but I'll only talk to Banjo or Kazooie. In a game that's all tongue-in-cheek humor and self-referential, this is the single most generic video gamey shit in the world. It just feels so artificial. 
Except for Jolly's Bar though, they're just straight up racist. You go there as Mumble and they're like, I'm sorry, your kind isn't allowed here. Like what the fuck, I was joking about the Jinjos and segregation earlier, but I'm starting to wonder if there really is something going on in the world of this game. If Banjo-Kazooie was about immediacy, Banjo-Tooie is more of a slow burn. Now, a lot of the time, I don't actually despise that super much because there are a lot of cool things that happen, like the interconnected jiggies, those are kick-ass. They're one of the things I love so much about this game. But a lot of the stuff like the transformations or mumbo magic feels like it could have been streamlined. And I give the transformations a tiny bit of leeway over Banjo-Kazooie just because they're cooler, but they do still interrupt the pacing of the game at times. Nevertheless, I would choose this van over the shitty pumpkin any day. I realize that a lot of my beef with these games stems from interruptions in the fact that I have speedrunner brain, and by speedrunner brain, I mean undiagnosed ADHD. I am aware that interruption of some kind is inevitable in every video game, and that there is no point in looking back at 20-year-old games that nobody cares about. About anymore. But I feel like there are lessons that can still be learned from these games and still have yet to be learned in some situations. A lot of people are disappointed by some of the choices they made in games like Ukulele, which indicates to me that there still exist pitfalls in making a 3D platformer. A lot of people believe this genre is dead and obsolete, but I don't think it has to be that way. I think you can still make a good 3D collectathon platformer, and you can do it without falling into these traps. No actual game developer will see this video, let alone listen to what I have to say, let alone take it to heart. But if there's an alternate dimension where they will, this is a tribute to you for keeping the genre alive, but also a warning so you avoid killing it. I just feel like with all the small to medium issues these games have, combined with just how far technology has come since, there is a massive potential for this genre to seriously come back and kick some ass. And we've seen some great games in recent years, like Hat in Time, and hopefully we will see even more as we go forth. And hopefully, they will take these criticisms to heart and avoid these mistakes in the future.